This is the story of John Harrison, the clockmaker who solved longitude. In March 1693, in a small town in Yorkshire named Fulby, John Harrison was born. Not much is known about his early life, and it isn't really helped by the fact that every member of his family is named the same things. Seriously, look it up, it's crazy. Anyway, the real points of interest start in Harrison's teenage years, when he started to become interested in clocks. In fact, he constructed his first while he was still a teenager. And as Harrison aged, he continued to hone his craft as a hobbyist clockmaker. Now, I want you to think about that word there, hobbyist. A hobbyist clockmaker wasn't something that existed. Clocks required a degree of precision that could only traditionally be learned through apprenticeships under experienced clockmakers, but not Harrison. Because of this lack of traditional instruction, however, Harrison also put some non-traditional elements into his clocks. His first was made entirely out of wood. And as his career grew, this continued. Eventually, Harrison drew the attention of a nearby town. They wanted him to build them a clock tower. But Harrison, he didn't build clock towers yet. And so his was completely different. Not an ounce of steel or iron was used in the construction, as Harrison feared the problems that could come from rust. Any parts that had to be made out of metal were brass. Most of the mechanics, however, weren't even brass. They were still wood, and that's just normal wood. Not your everyday, you can't see any trees back there. Not your everyday whatever wood. This was a special kind of tropical wood, which exuded its own oil, providing the lubrication for the clock. This in its own right was a huge innovation. Suddenly clock towers didn't need to be oiled. Not that it ever really caught on. But Harrison's true calling would come once he learned of something called the Longitude Prize. The Longitude Prize was established in the 1700s. Spain was the first country to enact such a law, but all other seafaring nations soon followed, including Great Britain. Wait, did Great, was it Great Britain yet? Yeah, okay, it was Great Britain. Great Britain did exist. They just, like, 10 years before this. So Great Britain established their prize for two and a, nope, not two and a half, for 25,000 pounds. In modern day, that is almost two million pounds, or two and a half million dollars. Ah, that was pretty good. That was, that's a lot of money. So... This understandably drew the attention of Harrison, who started to do work to build a marine timekeeper. With their longitude prize, Great Britain also established the Board of Longitude, which is an incredibly British sounding thing. The board was based out of London and their job was to determine whether or not someone's solution to longitude was actually a solution to longitude and would actually solve it. The Board of Longitude was based out of London. And so to London, Harrison went. He met up with one of the greatest minds of the day, Edmund Halley. Halley was an astronomer, not a clockmaker. So he sent Harrison to a man named George Graham. George Graham was one of the most famous clockmakers of his day. And Harrison stayed and worked under Graham for two years to build what is now known as H1, Harrison's first marine timekeeper. This timekeeper was displayed in Graham's workshop and garnered some interest, enough interest to pique the curiosity 
of the Board of Longitude who commissioned a test. Harrison and his son would go on an expedition aboard the HMS Centurion. Initial results weren't very promising. H1 was by no means perfect. However, as the voyage continued, the outlook improved. And on the return trip, Harrison even pointed out an error in the ship's calculations that meant that they were 60 miles off course. Once he had returned, Harrison went back to the Board of Longitude. They were impressed with his efforts and with his clock, but it did not meet their strict requirements. They didn't send away Harrison empty-handed, however. They sent him off with 500 pounds, money for him to use to build another marine timekeeper. And that is what Harrison did to varying degrees of success. Harrison's second was in timekeeper, H2, was not promising. It took him years to build and had unsolvable problems. Harrison quickly moved on to H3. That was one of the greatest mistakes of his career. H3 was a massively complicated clock each system having multiple systems designed to regulate and make it consistent. Inevitably, this only caused more problems and Harrison wasted almost 20 years of his life building a clock that would never work, that he had designed in such a way to be self-defeating. This was not the end of Harrison's quest though. Because after those 20 years of working on H3, he wasn't discouraged. Because he had found something that was more promising than any of his previous three clocks. And with it, he made a major innovation that allows the ultra-accurate clocks of today to exist. That innovation and that story begins with a pocket watch that Harrison commissioned with a radical new design while he was building H3. This wasn't even meant to be part of his quest for a marine timekeeper, but it quickly became one. Harrison's groundbreaking innovation was really startlingly simple. The special thing about his pocket watch was that it oscillated five times per second as opposed to the normal one. That faster oscillation made the clock radically more accurate, even leading, as I said, to the ultra-accurate quartz clocks of today, which oscillate 32,000 sometimes per second. Very soon after he got this pocket watch and saw its potential as a marine timekeeper, Harrison commissioned a fourth marine timekeeper, H4. No longer a large clock in a box, but rather merely an oversized pocket watch, handheld. This clock was promising enough that the Board of Longitude looked at Harrison again and were ready to test his method against the two other most promising methods of the time. Because despite my focus on clocks, the rest of the world kept on spinning and people kept on innovating in the realm of longitude. The moon has been one of humanity's companions since her dawn. Accompanying mankind at night with her lunar disk as the sun did during the day and providing the same function, the function of giving mankind sight if the moon's really... Okay, that metaphor kind of fell apart, but that's not the point. The point is we can use the moon to find time, which is the key to finding longitude. The reason for this is pretty simple. The moon doesn't follow exactly the same path in the sky all the time. It moves just a little bit in an incredibly complex and exacting cycle. If you had sufficient charts to track the motion of the moon through the night sky, then you could use that to solve longitude.
Okay. So, I might have run out of time and had the sun set on me. See? So, I'm going to do the rest of the video from this desk here. Now, where was I? The lunar distance method and the longitude expedition competition. So, the lunar distance method could be viable, but you needed an accurate way to measure angles and accurate charts of the moon, which they didn't have. That didn't stop the board though. And a guy who was probably going crazy from all the math he would have to do at night was sent on the expedition. The methods to be tested were Harrison's H4, Galileo's eclipse method, and the lunar distance method. The astronomer given the task of testing the two astronomical methods left in the fall of 1763, and Harrison followed with his son William and H4 in tow in March of the following year. As the voyages were heading to Barbados, there was going to be a challenging climate, and despite that, H4 performed phenomenally. It took two months to arrive, and at the end of it, H4 was off by only about 40 seconds. Unthinkable for a clock of that time period. The board recommended that Harrison be awarded the full 20,000 pound prize, but with a catch. They wanted Harrison to prove that other clockmakers could replicate H4 in a similarly accurate fashion. To make sure of this, the board recommended Harrison only be awarded half of his prize for the time being only to get the rest once they could have a copy of H4 built by another watchmaker. Parliament amended the law to meet the board's demands and, begrudgingly, Harrison cooperated. Enter Larkham Kendall, the watchmaker that the board requested make a copy of H4. This watch came to be known as K1. After testing the copy, it was found to perform just as well as the original, despite the board's concerns. Because of this, even more replicas were commissioned for use by sailors. However, the board no longer held Harrison in high regards. He wanted to keep his secrets to himself and to continue to profit from his inventions. In the pursuit of this, he alienated himself from the board to the point that they just didn't give him the second half of his money. Harrison, of course, still wanted that money, which led to the construction of H5, in the grand scheme of things, this clock isn't really that important. All he did with it was show it to King George III and get him to yell at Parliament until they gave Harrison his money. But that's like, amazing. So I wanted to mention it. So, John Harrison was the person who solved longitude. He built the first marine timekeeper and discovered a fundamental truth of clock making that would eventually lead the ultra-accurate quartz clocks of today. He even wrote a manuscript that, had it been sought to be understood in his day, could have allowed the construction of much more accurate land clocks as well. However, he is, for the most part, forgotten by history, because around the same time he made his breakthrough, the lunar distance method suddenly became far simpler. This was due to two separate innovations, those being the sextant to easily measure angles, and an astronomer named Tobias Meyer crafting the most perfect lunar tables to be seen up to that point. Leonard Euler, one of the most influential mathematicians of all time, called Meyer the greatest astronomer in Europe for his efforts. And Euler was right. Harrison may have made measuring longitude possible, but it was Meyer who made it cheap, if time consuming. So, here we are at the center of the hemisphere. That, that uh, part didn't really work anymore. I couldn't have been there if centuries ago there hadn't been an effort across all of the scientific world involving horologists, astronomers, and mathematicians to solve the problem that was longitude and to find a way to tell sailors exactly where they were at any given time. I mean, even if I could, I wouldn't because it wouldn't be a very interesting story then, but that's not the point. If I had a bigger budget, there would be a pullback shot here with a drone, but I have precisely no budget, so that's not going to happen. 
Thanks for watching.